Chatar and Nilo, he knew Melahalam, a share Kirishan who missed Vota, Vitzivanu, Lasso, pretty pray to Ra, 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 Lasso, pretty pray to Ra. Okay, uh, here, would you pass this, please? To Someone needs to take that tonight. All right, this is fabulous. We are going over Talmud, arguably the most important class you can have in this series. I actually would like to do a series of classes on just Talmud. Let's try and get this clip, get this here from it. Um, as opposed to Talmud and tobacco. As opposed to just really just studying Talmud every week for six months. Mm -hmm. um, here's the reality that Judaism does not exist in the 21st century except for Talmud. We don't practice biblical Judaism. Okay? So we practice rabbinic Judaism, which comes from the Talmud. Now again, Talmud means you will learn or you will teach. The structure is there's both Mishnah and Gemara. So the, the Mishnah and the Gemara, the additional. Content-wise, there is the Agadah, it's lore, and the Halakha, the law. Machlochet is the debate. Masakta is a tractate. Now, to give you an idea, these three books are all one tractate. Okay? This is the tractate of Baba Batra. And you can see this is what it looks like. Okay, I'm going to do this one. is part of the tractate. There's two of these for tractate Kiddushin, which is about marriage. And if you look, so this is what the page actually looks like. Okay? This is the Schottenstein edition. It has translation in English. Only of what's in the middle here. It doesn't have Ron Baum or the Tosafot or any of that. Only what's in the middle. And it typically takes somewhere between four and seven pages in English to correspond to one page of just the middle part of the Talmud. Daf Yomi is reading a page of Talmud a day, which means all of the, of the Mishnah or Gemara, the commentaries of Ron Baum, Rashi, et cetera, the Tosafot, every day in understanding it. If you do that, it takes you roughly seven and a half years to go through the whole time. But the question is not how many pages did you go through. The question is how many pages did, well, went through you. Yeah. So you know, slide that down there so you can get an idea. And, and, and it's really, Judaism is about Talmud. Now, every Masakta, every tractate, has a Mishnah and a Gemara with one exception. That is the exception of Pirkei Avot, which means ethics of our fathers. Um, it is a very small book. This actually is a book that has a commentary, but you can get a lot of pure care of boats, and it's very small. It's uh, six pair, it's six chapters, um, and someone's called it a rabbinic manual, a manual how to be a, a rabbi. But there are also multi-volume sets. I have, I don't know, seven, eight, maybe even ten commentaries on pure care of boats, but it's the only one that does not have a Gemara as well. It only has a mission. Okay. Often we have, and there's, and there's lots and lots of, of pure care about translations and commentaries. It's typical to study it between Passover and Shavuot. It's typical to study it when we're in mourning, that month of Shloshim. Okay, so that's because it's really guidelines. So we're going to do a little bit of study. But the thing to understand is that Talmud is what makes our world today. Our Jewish world does not exist without Talmud. And it's so important. So uh, uh, let's look a little bit. It's on the very beginning of this page, which is also, I think, online. Um, immediately prior to studying Pirkei Avot, we generally, generally say a quote from Sanhedrin, another tractate in Talmud. All Israel has a share in the world to come. Okay. The Holy One, blessed be he, wished to bestow merit upon Israel. Therefore, he gave them Torah and mitzvot in abundance. So we typically say after we study Pirkei Rabbi Yochanan Hassandler said, every assembly which is for the name of heaven will in the end become a permanent, a permanent value. And every assembly which is not for the name of heaven will in the end not become of permanent value. Because every time we gather to study like tonight, it is a value that cannot be erased from our judgment and we reap rewards in this world and the next. Because we're, as opposed to going to a political rally. Okay. Again, I was a little tired, so I got some Thai iced tea, the sugar, and the caffeine should be Interesting combination. Should be just keep me going for a You know what? I, it's, the boys needed to, they needed to have, do what they needed to do, and they needed to 
learn to body surf, and Daddy had to teach him, right? So it's a good one, it's a blessing. Yes. All right, so let's read a little bit from Kirkeo Boat. So uh, Kelly, why don't you start just reading the first? This is, by the way, where we get where Talmud is from. Okay, when we want to know why we talk about the oral Torah. Remember, I said Moses is asking, you know, write stuff down. He's asking God questions, and God tells him. Okay, who's gone? All Israel has no, no, go to where it says one one. one one. Moses received the Torah at Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets to the men of the great synagogue. It's the also many great assembly. The great assembly. Okay. The later used to say three things: be patient in the administration of justice. Rear many disciples and make a fence around the Torah. So, don't be rushing to judgment. Be patient. Make many disciples. A good rabbi, a good man, a good human being, creates many more people to do it than just himself. Yogi Bhajan Khalsa, who brought Kundalini Yoga to this country, once said, I did not come here to make disciples, I came here to make teachers. He wanted to have as many people that he taught to then be teachers. And to make a fence around the Torah. This is an important concept in Judaism. This is the idea that you bring a fence around the Torah. So the, the easy example is milk and meat. You know, milk comes from meat, so they can't be mixed. Chicken should be par, but it should be neutral. However, it's not, because the rabbis built a fence. They felt that, okay, someone might think they're eating burnt chicken when they're eating really eating burnt meat. So to make it easier to build a fence around it so that we don't, the Jews don't make mistakes. They don't fall into doing the wrong thing. Okay? Um, so that's a simple example of making a fence around the Torah. Please continue. Simon, Simon, Simeon. Simeon the Righteous was one of the last of the men of great synagogue. He used to say, the world is based upon three things, the Torah, divine service, and the practice of Torah, the Christian. word of God, Azbodah, holy service, and give me little chasadim, that acts of loving kindness. This is the tripod upon which all of the world is based. Please continue. And to the mess, a man of so so Soho. Soho received the oral tradition from Simeon the righteous. He used to say, Be not like unto servants who serve the master in the expectation of receiving a gratuity. But be like unto servants who serve the master without the expectation of receiving the gratuity, and let the awe of heaven be upon you. Okay, so this is really important that we are not to, as I just said, this dialogue with a bar mitzvah boy, uh, that it's not about we do what we do in order for a reward. We do what we do because it's the right thing to do so we can serve the greater master. All right? Alan, you turn the page and, and uh, uh, read, read some of this. And you can read this because your wife's next to you, so if she hits you, it's not a problem. I mean, go ahead. Other than, uh, Jose Yohanan, a man of Jerusalem, used to say, let thy house be wide open, and let the poor be members of thy household. Engage no one's not. got a problem with that one, right? <laughs> we should, okay, the next one people often have a problem with. Go on. Engage not in too much conversation with women. <laughs> go on. <laughs> they said this regards... Uh, to one's own wife, how much more does the rule apply with regard to another man's wife? Hence, the sages said, as long as a man engages in too much conversation with women, he causes evil to himself, for he goes idle from the study of the word of the Torah, so that his end will be that he will inherit yeah, he will hear a, 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 a hell type of existence. So, okay. This is not as misogynistic as it sounds. And I'm not being an apologist. It's really honest. Um, I have a friend, a man named James Orr. James is a writer director. Uh, wrote a number of wonderful movies. He lives in Vegas now. He uh, wrote. Father of the Bride and Sister Act and Three Men and Babies, very funny movies, right? Yeah. He also was a member of a place called the Grand Havana, which is a cigar club in Beverly Hills. It's a men's cigar club in Beverly Hills. Okay? 90% of the members are men. When it first opened up, especially the waitresses were all young and gorgeous. And you remember how the old Playboy Club, the Playboy would do their Playboy dip these waitresses actually would get on their knees to give a drink to the members. 
actually, um, it was a different day. This was back in the 80s and 90s. So James wrote a movie called Blowing Smoke. And it's, it's probably the most offensive movie I've ever seen in my life. Also, one of the most honest movies I've ever seen in my life. It's five or six guys um, in a cigar club playing poker after hours. And a beautiful girl comes in, she's banging on the door, help me, help me, someone's trying to hurt me. My ex boyfriend's trying to do whatever he help me out, but you gotta let me in. And so, all these guys who are between 40 and 70, wealthy men, playing with smoking their big cigars playing in the cigar room, right, playing poker. Now in comes this 25-year-old hottie. And you watch these men just become morons. <laughs> they just become, I don't recommend watching the movie because the language is extremely rough. It's very, very rough language. It's, I've never heard the C word used that many times in, in an hour and a half in my life. It's very offensive. And yet there's an, an underlying truth to it. That these guys who are all hanging out and they're all doing whatever, all of a sudden, a young woman comes in and they become just idiots. <laughs> yes. There's a wonderful film that Gregory Peck did. He was bombed in the United States called Mackenzie's Hole. Same type of story? Uh, no, well, it's based on some men who find and hear and track down an Indian gold mine. And these men come together and they go machia looking for the gold. It's like treasure is right? right? I won't go into all the details. So this, it's irrelevant, but the same concept. You know, so right? these guys. So the idea is that our sages recognize that. If, so men are studying Talmud, okay, and a woman gets involved. Look, Allison starts talking to me. Depending on what she's wearing, I may be extremely distracted. <laughs> It's not a bad thing. No, it's not normal. It's a good thing, right? Sure so the idea, exactly. So the idea is that we need to be more conscious of not engaging in frivolous conversation. Yes, go ahead. You show me a group of men and a young, hot chick walks in the door. At my age, I'll still go, hama, 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 hama. <laughs> I've told the story numerous times. I think you guys have heard it. We're, Alice and I are at a Persian wedding once, and there's a young woman walking yeah. to here, micro mini dress, lace. I am not going to turn my head because no one wants to see the rabbi go like that. She walks by, Alice and goes, Oh my God. She's in a micro mini lace dress, high heels, no stockings, and nothing under the lace. And yes, there, it's very clear there was nothing under the lace. And she pulled, but the point is, Talmud is teaching us here. It's actually being really wise. If I'm speaking with my wife, I'm not necessarily going to be talking or learning Torah. How much more so if I'm talking to another? Makes mm -hmm. sense? All right, go on out. Go on, keep reading about Joshua. <laughs> Joshua Terahia used to say, appoint for thyself a teacher and acquire for thyself a companion and judge all men in the scale of merit. Make for yourself a teacher, acquire for yourself a friend. And judge all man, men in the scale of merit. I just want to read the next three. These are all just different things from from Pierre Go on. Judah. No, 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 Alex, go ahead. Wait, Judah B. Judah Ben Tabai. Tabai said, "Do thou not, as a judge, play the part of a camera of a counselor?" I'm sorry. And with they, with they, I, for example, the parties in a lawsuit. Are standing before thee. Let them be regarded by thee as if they were both of them guilty or wicked. The Hebrew word means both. And when they leave they, thy presence after, having submitted to the judgment, let them be regarded by thee as if they were both.
both of them go to Isn't that a beautiful teaching for judge for a yeah, judge? But I have a question. Yeah. Why do they use formal English? Oh, it's just a bad translation. That's this is just a bad translation. Okay. Um that's it's just a bad translation. Use, I, 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 even in uh, uh, this is just that's just I copied it from this so, the and the Yeah, no, that's just I copied it from either Safari or that's that. So as an example, this one, um, the, the same exact line in this in this particular, I, I may have copied from here actually. It looks like I may have copied from here based on the, uh, that was two, two. Um, uh, <coughs> oh, it's one eight, I'm sorry. Um, one eight. So if I go to one eight here, I, and I may have copied it from here actually, I have to be honest. Um, but it's totally totally translation. I was just asking why. Yeah, no, no, it's just it's totally translation. Okay, so this one says, when litigants stand before you regard them both as guilty, but when they leave having accepted the judgment, regard them both as guiltless. Yeah. That it uses regular English. So this is from I was just wondering why they Yeah, no, no, just because someone that. that was just very hard. It sounds pretentious. It is. So, uh, but this I I copied this this off the internet probably, so, so. probably Safari um, or Sosina. Okay, go please go on. Go, go one fourteen. Right. Me, Julio, Julio, we used to say, if I am not for myself, <coughs> who is for me? But if I am for my own self only, what am I? If not now, when? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? If not now, when? Hillel was uh, this incredibly wise. We're going to talk about Hillel often is arguing with Shammai. Um, we find, go ahead and give me, give me another one. We'll hear about it from uh, Pair 2 from Robin Gabaliel. Robin Gabaliel, the son of our Ju Rabbi Judah, the patriarch, said, Excellent is the study of the Torah together with the worldly occupation. For the energy taken up by both of them keeps sin out of one's mind. And as for all study of the Torah, where there is no worldly occupation, the end thereof is that it becomes to not and bring the sin in its train. And all who labor with the community, let them labor with them for the sake of the name of heaven, for the merit of their father sustains them, and their righteousness endures forever. So that is a horrible translation. Um, it is good to combine the study of Torah with an occupation, but the effort required by both of them keeps sin out of mind. But all Torah study that is not combined with work will ultimately cease and will lead to sin. All who occupy themselves with the affairs of the community should also be engaged with them for the sake of heaven. For the merit of their fathers assist them and the righteousness endures forever. So the idea being that We need to occupy ourselves with the world and Torah. If you're just occupying yourself with the world, you lose your ethics, you lose your soul. If you're just occupying yourself with Torah, you lose your values as well, and you lose your soul. That's why the teacher rabbi had occupations. They all work. They didn't you are commanded, so the reason a temple pays a rabbi is to, so that he doesn't take a job doing something else. Today. Yeah. Today, and that's the way. Just the opposite. They Correct. Which doesn't make a lot of sense when you think of all these rabbis who would be unemployable in, in the real world and we're just pulling out a lot of money. Right? Yeah. But that's it. So Pirkei Avot is filled with these aphorisms, these statements, these ideas. All right. Now let's talk about pairing. So we, we have what's called this machlokas or machloka, this debate, this argument, this war between sages. And then we have partners and people, these, these sparring partners, race location. And one of the great ones is Rabbi Hillel and Shemai. So Hillel, is this fabulous being who is very kind of populist. Shammai, on the other hand, is usually right. But we side with Hillel because we like him most of the time. So here are some stories, and this is from uh, the, the Masek to Shabbat. This is the Talmudic tractate on Shabbat. Okay? And Talmud is written in shorthand. So if you're seeing a, a um, uh, the, the dark print, that in almost that's what the Talmud actually says. 
And all the light print, and this is the translation, is to help put it in sentence form and proper grammar. Because Talmud is, is, is written in assurance. So what really literally is said here that we're going to study is, the rabbi is taught in a brisa, one should always be humble, like Hillel, one not be stern, like Shammai. It once happened, two people made a bet with one another. Okay, so you see, so it's a little bit, so it, it's filling it. But we can read the whole sentence. So <laughs> let's read about Hillel a little bit. Carolyn, you're back. Would you read where it starts? Says the Gemara uh, cites other examples of ways. The Gemara cites Rabban Gabriel's final teaching on the no, start, start right down here. Right, we're right, on the bottom right where it says the Gemara. The, Gemara the rabbi is taught in a baraisa. Cites like some other examples of ways that someone responded to sarcastic or otherwise improper questions. The rabbi is taught in a bar baraisa. Baraisa is an early teaching. Okay. One should always strive to be humble, gentle, and his ways like Hillel, and would not be stern and unyielding like Shemai. The Barisa illustrates this with story. It once happened that two people. So, this is a story. So, is it going to be Halakha or Agadah? It's going to be Agadah, right? It's going to be a story. Yeah. But from it, we're going to find out about how we're supposed to behave on the Halakha. That does make sense. All right, go on. All right, two people. They made a bet with one another. Okay, that's it. In a bit with one another, they said, whoever goes and provokes Hillel to use his, lose his temper, let him take 400 <coughs> as his prize. Thereupon, one of them said, I will provide him. I will provoke provoke him. him. I will provoke him. The par Barisa recounts the events that followed. That day, it so happened, it was Friday, the eve of Sabbath. And Hillel was busy washing his head, i.e. his hair, in preparation for the Sabbath. So he's taking a bath, right? Water's nice and warm, it's cozy, he's, in, he's not got like shower coming out of a faucet in his bath, and he's meditating, he's getting ready, he's showering his head. Okay. And as he was doing this, this person went and passed by the doorway of his house, calling, is there a Hillel here? Is there a Hillel here? Hillel put on his cloak and went out to greet the person and said to him, my son, what do you see? The person replied to him, I have a question to ask of you. Hillel said to him, ask my son, ask. The person then posed his query. Why is it that the heads of Babylonians are so brown? Okay, so let's think about it. He's getting ready for Sabbath. He's naked. He's in his bath. He's washing his hair. He's getting prepared. Is there a lull here? Is there a lull here? Then he gets up, dries off, puts on his bathrobe, comes out. How can I help you, my son? And this, this Schmendrick says, why are the heads of Babylonians so round? Go on. And Hillel replied to him, My son, you have asked a truly profound question. The reason is because they do not have skillful midwives. Okay. <laughs> so he answers, first of all, he makes the guy feel good that he asked a question. Okay. First of all, he's so kind. And so Your question is so profound and it's very wise. So I will tell you it's because their midwives are horrible. Okay, go on. So now what's he going to do? Uh, the person then went away and waited a while. And then he returned to the front of Hillel's house. And so what happened? He went away. So what did Hillel go do? Back in the bath. Took off his bathrobe. Back. Got back warm. Had to warm back up the water. All right, water doesn't come out warm out of the faucet. Warms back up the water. Gets in to start washing his head. And? and? Is there a Hillel here? Is there a Hillel here? Hillel again put on his cloak and went up to meet the person <laughs> and said to him, My son, what do you see? The person replied to him, I have a question to ask of you. Hillel said to him, Ask my son, ask. The person then asked, Why is it that the eyes of the Harmodians are especially round? Hillel replied to him, My son, you have asked a profound question. The reason is because they live in sandy terrain. By the desert, they were nomadic people, oh, oh, so this dinner. prevents the, the wind from burning their eyes. Okay. The person then went away and waited a while. Okay. So, what happened? Why? So, so, again, they're so profound. This guy who leaves, Hillel is going to get back in. Fills back up the bath, puts in the warm water, gets his soap, gets back into, you know, ready to go for Shabbos. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, and then, then he returned to Hillel's door and called out, "Is there a Hillel here? Is there a Hillel here?" Once again, put on his cloak and went out to greet him and said to him, "My son, what do you seek?" The person replied to him, "I have a question to ask of you." Hillel said to him, "Ask my son. Ask." The person then asked, "Why is it that the feet of Africans are so wide?" <laughs> 
And I'll reply to him, my son, you've asked a profound question. The reason is because they live in swampland. Sure, it's the white feet, they won't sing in the swamp. So ridiculous questions. He makes the person feel special. He makes the person feel a great question. Request, you know, like he's why, you know, it, look, this is a profound but the fact that you're asking any question is profound. And so each time, but look, and he hasn't gotten cranky yet. He hasn't said, hey, Schmendrick, why did you ask me about the Africans when you asked me about the Babylonians or the Harmonians? Why do you have to make me keep going in and out? It doesn't do that at all, does it? He's right. really kind. Go on, please. Having failed to exasperate Hello with his earlier questions, the person made one last attempt to do so. He said to him, I have a great many questions to ask, and I am fearful that you may become angry with me. Hello. First off, how many of us would become angry with him? Be pretty easy, wouldn't it? Go on. Oh, yeah. Hello wrapped himself in his cloak, sat down in front of him, and said to him, Every question you have to ask, feel free to ask. The person then said to him, are you the great Hillel, whom they call the Nisai of the Jewish people? Hillel Nasi, replied, the prince. The prince. The Hillel replied, yes. The person then said to him, if it is indeed you, let there not be many like you among the Jewish people. Hillel replied, my son, why do you say such a thing? The person responded, because on your account I have lost 400 zoos. And he revealed to Hillel the wager he had made. Hillel responded to him, one should always vigilantly guard his disposition so that he maintains equanimity in all situations. Hillel is worth your losing on his account 400 zoos and yet another 400 zoos, but Hillel will not take offense. So what starts is the story about a wager, right, between two guys, I'm going to make them get angry, ends up giving us a teaching of how we should live. We should always be vigilant about our disposition. Right? Right. The, the Adada, the story, leads to a practice, a way of going, the halacha. All right, now why don't you read the next story about Rabbi Hillel? Let's see. Uh, Barisha shows how Hillel's exceptional humility succeeded in bringing others closer to God. The rabbi taught in a Barisha. It once happened that a Gentile came before Shammai and said to him, How many Torahs do you Jews have? Shammai replied to him, we have two, the written Torah and the oral Torah. The Gentile said to him, as for the Torah that is written, I believe you. I guess I don't have the book. I believe you, that is, but it was given by God. But concerning the Torah that is oral, I do not believe. Convert me to Judaism on one con uh, convert me to Judaism on one condition that you will teach me only the written Torah that I have been shall be bound only by its tenets. Upon hearing this, Shemai berated him for his insolence and sent him away with disapprovingly. Mm. Afterwards, however, the Gentile came before Hillel with the same request, and Hillel converted. The Barisha relates the end of the story. <clears throat> One day, Hillel taught the alphabet to the new convert, saying to him, Alphabet, Yimodal, and so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, go on. Uh, but the following day, when the convert came for his next lesson, Hillel reversed the name of the letters for him, teaching him that the letters <coughs> he had called Aleph on one day was really a, a, a tal, and so on, taking a back. Taken aback by this change, the converse said to Hillel, But yesterday you did not recite it to me this way. Hillel replied to him, You see then, are you not relying on me to recognize the letters of the alphabet? Rely on me also then about the veracity of the oral law. So see, Shemaiah said, No, this is ridiculous. You gotta have Talmud, you gotta do oral Torah. And Hillel said, oh, fine. And then he taught the guy, you're relying on me that this is what all looks like. This is what Bet looks like. So rely on me for this part, too. Rely on T-shirt, T-shirt. Let's do one more story. Alex, would you read the next one? This is a very, very famous one. A second narrative again depicts Hillel's interaction with a prospective convert. There was another incident involving a certain Gentile who came before Shemai and said to him, 
convert me to Judaism on condition that you will teach me the entire Torah. Uh, while I stand on one foot. Upon oh. hearing these words, Shemai pushed the person away with the ruler he was holding in his hand. Undeterred, the Gentile came before Hillel and presented him with the same request. And Hillel converted him. Before the conversion, Hillel said to him, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. There in a few words is an entire Torah. All the rest is but an elaboration of this one simple point. I've heard it's called commentary. Right, same thing. It's elaboration is what it says. Well, oh, now go and learn. I'm sorry. That's the real big part that's off on my back. Yeah. Now go and learn. Yeah. Go live. So, um, teach me the entire Torah, stand on my foot. Shemai throws his ruler, by the way, Orlando. I think there's a whole thing about where, what of the things Shemai did, uh, since he often is holding a ruler or a scale or a, 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 no, a measuring stick of some sort, um, a building of construction or architecture you will find in Shemai's hand throughout at different times. Just, uh, it's just something I've noticed over things. Because he says to the ruler, he happens to have a ruler hand. Why is he got a ruler hand? He says, get out of here. Aside. And Hillel says, don't do to anyone else what you don't want doing to me, them doing it to you. That's the entire tour. The rest is commentary. Now go and do it. Yeah. You know, people have said, well, that's the golden rule. No, it's not. The golden rule says if, that Jesus says, if do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That means that if I'm a masochist, I get to be sadistic to other people. Hillel avoids that because he says, don't do it anyone else, but you don't want them to do it. So Hillel and Shammai are an example of these sparring partners. Okay? <laughs> Let's look and turn the page to 84A and Bob Mephisio. This is about the sparring partners of Yochanan and Reish Lakish. Yochanan and Reish Lakish, at the top of the page it says Yochanan and Reish Lakish. Yeah, yeah. It's page 84a in chapter 7, Bama oh, okay. So Rachel Kish and Yochanan are sparring partners. They're brothers-in-law. Did we talk about them last week? Uh, one time. We might, I don't think we talked about them last week. So let's see. So uh, I'll start reading the story. One day Rabbi Yochanan was swimming in the Jordan River, and Rachel Kish, who was then a burglar, a highwayman, saw him and jumped into the Jordan River after. Why did he jump in? Because Rabbi Yochanan was one of the most gorgeous beings that ever lived. He had long, dark hair to his tofas. And from behind, Mr. Berlin, Mr. Hyroman, Rachel Akish, sees Yochanan, and he's thinking, bada bing, bada boom, that's a good looking girl. I'm going out there and going to get me some. Okay. <laughs> so what's going on? That's why he jumps into the Jordan. Yochanan beheld this display of vitality and said to him, You're strong. Because Yochanan turns around, Rachel Akish goes, Whoa! Your strength belongs to the Torah. And Rachel Akish says, Your beauty belongs to women. Yochanan says to him, if you will repent your ways, I will give you my sister in marriage, and she's more beautiful than I am. Rachel Kish accepted this upon himself. Rachel Kish then wanted to return to retrieve his clothes back at the beach, but was unable to muster the strength to do so. When he, when he gave all of his passion to God, he gave all of his passion to God, he didn't even have the strength to swim back. Hmm. Rachel Kish didn't do anything halfway. He was the best of the highway, the best of the rabbis. When he thought he was going to go do something with this girl with long hair and the screen. He rushed out when he gave all his passion to God. He had all his passion. Okay. Afterwards, Rabbi Yochanan taught him scripture and mission and made him into a great man. So this is the beginning and end of their story. Okay. This makes this is the beginning and end of the story. Throughout Talmud, the two of them are always dialoguing. One day, one day, many years later, they're disputing the following point in the study hall. Mission. <coughs> excuse me. Mission states the sword and this knife and the hunting spear, and the military spear, and the, and the hand sickle, and the harvesting sickle. From what point are they capable of becoming tamé? No, it's not clean. Is it from the time? It is from the time of the completion of the production. So you're making a knife, right? Making a knife. Now, at a certain point, it's going to become a weapon. And at a certain point, it's going to be a butter knife, right? When it's a butter knife, we can use it. When it's a weapon, it's used for something else. So, you with me so far? So that's our question. And it, and it answers itself. It says right here, it goes on, that uh, it is from the completion of their production. Okay, so now the rabbis are going to say, when is the completion of their production? Rabbi Yochanan says, when the metal utensils are, are tempered in a furnace. 
Okay, so when you put them in the fire to temper them, that's when that when you're making them now. When you're making yeah. them, that's when it becomes determined as a butter knife or a, or a weapon. Yeah. Rachel Kish says, no, no, no. When they're polished with water, after they come out of the tempering, after they come out of the oven. Okay. The Okanon says to Rachel Kish, the thief knows the tools of his thievery. What's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. He brought up the past. Yeah. You guys been married how many years? Forty. Ever good to bring up the past in an argument? Not ever, not ever, never, never. Doesn't help, does it? Doesn't help. Recipe for disaster, mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. A thief knows the fools of his thievery. Rachel Kish replied to him, and how have you benefited me? They're among the thieves. They called me rabbi because I was their leader, and here they call me rabbi because I'm their leader. Yochanan said to him, I benefited you, and then I brought you under the wings of the divine presence. Which is true. But is that a teacher's job to say that? You're great because of me? No, it's not okay, is it? The Elkanon became disheartened because of Rachel Kish's response. Because Rachel Kish was saying, you know, also was saying, you know, you're humiliating me. And, and they're both wrong, right? Rachel Kish is wrong for challenging his teacher publicly that way. The Elkanon is wrong for embarrassing his student publicly that way, right? The mm -hmm. became disheartened. Rachel Kish became ill. Rabbi Yochanan's sister, who was Rachel Kish's wife, comes before her brother Rabbi Yochanan. She cried and pleaded with him to pray for Rachel Kish's recovery. She said to him, Act for the sake of my children, prevent their father from dying. In other words, Rachel Kish is ill because Yochanan has become disheartened with his student. Okay? And the energy is changing everything. And, he, and Yochanan, instead of saying, You're right, I'm going to stop thinking bad about Rachel Kish, he says, Leave your orphans, I will sustain them. That's a quote from Jeremiah. Saying to his, his sister, don't worry, if they're orphans, I'll take care of them. She said, ask for the sake of my impending widowhood. And he said to her again from Jeremiah, let your widows trust in me. Rishiman ben Lakish passed away. Rish Lakish died. But Yochanan was grieved after him. Rabbi Yochanan was grieved after him considerably. The rabbi said, who shall go and bring comfort to his mind? And rabbi Eliezer ben Pedas should go, for his scholarship is brilliant. Rabbi Eliezer ben Pedas went and sat before him. And everything Rabbi Yochanan would say, Rabbi Eliezer would say to him, we learned a Baraisa that supports you. We learned a Baraisa that supports you. Rabbi Yochanan eventually said to him, you're supposed to be like Barlakisha, Rachel Lakish. Barlakisha, whenever I would say something, he'd pose 24 difficulties to me. I'd give him 24 solutions. And as a result of this give and take, the subject became more clear because the reality is God is infinite. And the dialogue is needed. However, you, Eliezer, you constantly say, we learned a Baraisa that supports you. But what use is this? Do I not already know I'm saying I'm right? Rabbi Yochanan would go about and tear his clothes and cry and say, Where are you, Barlakisha? Where are you, Barlakisha? And he would scream until his sanity wore away from him. The rabbis prayed for mercy for him, and Rabbi Yochanan passed away. Mm -hmm. From this we learn we should not speak ill of people publicly or privately. We should respect our teachers, we should respect our students. Right? But it's all done in a storytelling way, isn't it? Is the, is the same thing you can apply. If you have something to say to somebody, they can be considered critical. There's two ways to go about doing it. One, you do it publicly, and you insult them by asking them. Even if you don't mean to, it can still become as an insult, and the reaction can be not what you expect. And you don't ever bring up past arguments. Right. However, if you're, in, if you're worried about somebody, Treating you a certain way, you call them up and talk to them privately. That's what the implication exactly. is. And, and don't bring up someone's history. Well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not, but I'm you, not, but I'm you not don't, alluding to that. But that's also part of it here. You don't bring up someone's history. You know what? There have been many, many, many great rabbis, teachers, leaders, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, great, great people who, who, you know what, they sowed their oats when they were young, or they did whatever was wrong. Why are we judging a, a potential justice on something that they did or said when they were in high school, when they were 16? To do them harm. It's not right, is it? No. So that's an example. All right, let's look at another thing. I did start talking about this last week, about... The story we're going to really study. Remember, I said that there's a beautiful story uh, about the oven. So we're going to read that piece about the oven. I'll, I'll start reading it. So let's we'll learn about it. 
This is Bob Matsya 59. It's where it says, Lo Bashamayim Ki, it is not in heaven. This, by the way, is the most fun piece of Talmud to ever teach Catholic students at a university. Okay. Because they all think that God's going to throw lightning bolts down. It's great. Following mission, I'll lose to an instant which a, a, a sage was offended. We learned here in a mission. If someone cuts sections for an oven and puts sand between the sections to cement them together, and the oven then came in contact with something that was impure um, after they've been put you know, together, Rabbi Lazar calls it to four, that it's pure, the sages call it to me, that it is unpure. impure. Okay, so Eliezer, Rabbi Akiva's teacher, says it's kosher. It's two, the, the issue is two, two disparate type of things cemented together into an oven, okay, so, or into a, a, a bowl. So, as an example, now remember, there is a major rule in everything I do. Don't laugh. No laugh. Thank you. Thank you so much. We never laugh at that. Because we know it's cool. Never bring up older That's artwork right. either. Because right. So here's so here you've got I've already made a mistake. I'm only using one color. So you've got this. Let's try and do this. So you've got this thing. And it's like one of those, remember when you were a kid and you made those clay pots by making long rope, rope and then you put them together and they, okay. So you've got this thing and it's, there's two different subject matters going, okay? So you've got, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's cemented together, but they're two different things, okay? That's what we're asking. And is this kosher? Is it not kosher? Is it fit? Is it not fit? Literally, to or or to me. Right? That's the question before the court. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's called the oven of the coiled serpent. And it's explained what is meant by the coiled serpent. Rabbi Huda said in the name of Shmuel that it means that the sages surrounded it with discussions like a coiled snake. Um, and, they, and they decided that it is uh, to me. It is, it is not okay. Okay? But it goes on. On that day, Rabbi Eliezer, this great mystic, the teacher Rabbi Kiva, advanced all the arguments in the world to defend his lenient ruling, but the sages did not accept his arguments. Eliezer said to them, if the law is with me, let the carob tree prove it, whereupon the carob tree was uprooted from its place and moved 100 almost, some say even 400 almost, 100 yards, 400 yards. Unconvinced, the sages said to him, you cannot bring proof from a carob tree. Okay? So if I'm right with the carob tree, prove it, the carob tree gets up. This, by the way, teaches us one of the primary things in Judaism. We don't care about miracles. The fact that a miracle happens makes no bearing on our decision-making process. Okay? I don't care if you change water to wine all day. I don't care. I, it, it means absolutely nothing in terms of, of, of us accepting judgments. Okay, so. Um, they say you can't prove care tree. He then, Eliezer then says to him, if it laws with me, let the water canal prove where upon the water in the canal flow backwards. The sage just says you can't bring proof, proof from a water can. So he says to them, if the law accords with me, let the walls of the house of study prove it. And whereupon the walls of the study wall leaned and remained the stag. And Rabbi Yahushua rebuked the walls and said to them, if Torah scholars actually are in war with one another with words and discussions about law, halacha, what business is of yours? The walls did not fall in respect for Rabbi Yahushua, neither did they write themselves in the air this way even today. Rabbi Yahushua then said to the sages, look, the laws with me that have a Whereupon a holy voice, a bot coal, went forth and proclaimed, What argument do you have with Eliezer, whom the law follows in all places? And they looked at it and they heard this. And Rabbi Yeshua got up and he said, Lo Bashamayim, he it's not in heaven. Mm. Because in Parsha Shoftim, it says, You will go to the judge of your time and place. Right? Because you gave us the Torah, it's ours to do with it as we choose. What is meant by not in heaven, Gamar interjects. Rabbi Yermahu said, it means that we pay no heed to a heavenly echo in matters of halacha, of law, for the Torah was already given to man in Mount Sinai. The Gemara then relates the rest of Rabbi Yeshua's response to the heavenly echo. Now, most of the time when people study this passage of Torah, when rabbis teach, that's where they end. Okay? And they use it as a way of saying, see, power is in the hands of the rabbi. Because that's what it says, right? Okay. Right. So they that's all they teach. Often that's where that's which I think is a travesty. But 
I didn't know that's right. Yeah. Ram, uh, I was always under the impression that rabbinical Judaism started with the fall of the Second Temple. No, that's just before that. That's just before that. Because, because it, it, was, it was designed, since the Temple fell, right. the rabbi decided they had to have something to hold it together. Yes. Joel Gerlach does some wonderful work on that, as does um, um, but, so, so, but it's already going on before that. Okay. okay. It's already rabbinic Judaism. It's just not separate from the temple Judaism because you're still the temple. The temple's all gone. You only have rabbinic Judaism. Okay. All right. So, uh, that's where they generally ended, but let's go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Give one more paragraph. Rabbi Nisan, Nisan once met Elijah. Nisan said to him, what was the Holy One blessed be he doing at that moment? When, when Rabbi Shua rejected that we signal, Elijah responded to him, he said, the Holy One was laughing and saying, my children have prayed over me, my children have defeated me. That's generally where it stops. It starts there and stops there. Okay? This proves that even God wants it to be in the hands of the rabbis to do decisions. Very self -serving. But let's talk about what goes on. A number of drastic developments followed the debate concerning the oven and the price of course. They said that on that day, the sages collected all the things that Rabbi Eliezer had declared pure. Okay? Do I really need my glasses? Then? And he burned them in a fire, and they excommunicated him. Okay? So he's disagreed with them, and they have now excommunicated him. And for everything, they invalidated all his judgments. They said, who will go and inform them? Rabbi Akiva said to them, I will go because I'm concerned that perhaps an unfit person will go and inform him and bring about the destruction of the entire world. And what did Rabbi Akiva do? He dressed in black, cloaked himself in back, and sat before Eliezer at a distance of four amma. Why? What do you do if you're around the corpse? You dress in black, you sit on the floor four yards away. Hmm. So he came to his dear friend and teacher, dressed in mourning and treating Eliezer as if he was a corpse, hmm. as if he was dead. Because effectively he was. He's been excommunicated, right? Eliezer said to him, Akiva, why is today different from other days? And Akiva replied to him, My teacher, it seems to me that your colleagues are removed from you. In other words, at this point, Eliezer was, Oh, they, they think I'm dead. They view me as dead. I'm excommunicated. I'm not part of my community anymore which made him miserable, and he tore his garments and he removed his shoes, and he slid off his chair and sat on the ground, and tears flowed from his eyes, and the world itself was smitten, a third of the world's olives, a third of its wheat, and a third of its barley became ruined, and some say, even though already in a woman's hand, it became spoiled. It's pretty serious over damn up. Mara continues, a rice of talk, a great Blow occurred on that day, for every place in which Eliezer set his eyes upon went up in flames. And it happened that day, even happened that Rabbi Gamaliel, the prince, the head of the son, head of the assembly, was coming in a boat, and a gale threatened to drown him. And Gamaliel says, Rabboni Sha'ola, master of the universe, it seems to me that this is only because of Rabbi Eliezer. And, and Gamaliel stood on his feet and said, Master of the universe, Rabboni Shalom, it should be known to you that I did not do this, in other words, order of Eliezer's excommunication, for my own honor, or for the honor of my father's household, but for your honor, so that disputes not proliferate in Israel, whereupon the seed subsided from its region. Ima Shalom, the wife of Rabbi Eliezer, was the sister of Rabbi Gamaliel, and again we have the brother-in-law relationship. And from that day forward, of the Rabbi Gamaliel excommunicating Rabbi Eliezer on where she did not let Rabbi Eliezer fall on his face and recite the top of her supplication, which ends up praying for justice. You don't always do it, which is the idea that would destroy our enemies. It's one of the things that could happen. One day she thought it was a new moon when it was not. Because a new moon, you don't recite top of it. But she had confused a full moon with a deficient moon, right? Because some months have a full moon, some do not. Or they, you think they do, but they don't, right? And there are those who say that a poor basin came and stood at the door of Rabbi Eliezer, who was about to, to recite the talking of supplication, which read out to him. Either way, 
after it says, either way, she afterwards found the rabbi, rabbi Eliezer falling on his face, resuscitation on top of him. She said to him, get up, you're killing my brother. Meanwhile, the announcement went forth from the house of Rabbi Gamaliel that he had died. Eliezer said, how did you know about Rabbi Gamaliel's death? She said to him, I received the tradition from the house of my grandfather, King David, that all the gates of, of, of all the gates of heaven are locked except for the gates of Mona Ah. A wrongdoing of speaking evil about someone. All the boys used to do all their life. So let's look at this for a minute. Okay? We're discussing whether no one's kosher or not. Whether no one's to whore or not. Eliezer says it's to whore. They all say no, it's not. It's not. So we're right with the tree prove it. The tree proves it. They say we don't care about a tree. He says, if I'm right, let the water canal prove it. The water canal runs backwards. We don't care about water canal. But I'm right. Let the let the walls of the house of study prove it. They start to fall. We don't care about walls of study. So I'm right. Let God prove it. Every rabbi says stop arguing with Eliezer. They say stay out of it. Elijah the prophet says God was laughing at this. He enjoyed it. My children prevailed. But as a result of it, they excommunicate Eliezer. They invalidate all of his judgments and they excommunicate him. When he realizes this, that things are horrible. And, and another story is that Galileo, the head of the assembly, he realized the storms to kill him until he says to God, God, I didn't do this for my glory. I did this so that disputes would not proliferate in Israel. At which point the storms decided, leading us to believe that that is why Galileo did it, that it was important. Ultimately, Galileo dies. And the answer is that's communicated Galileo dies. There's storms. All over nothing. I don't think that makes sense. And so we have a commentary after that says the case of Baba Mansia, Baba Mansia, the needs of the tribe of the little God. You can read it on your own. But here's the basic concept. It's the next page. You're all done. Okay. So it was a commentary that I wrote years and years ago. Here's the idea. We're told we should look at before and after any verse to understand what's going on. This is a phantasmagoric story. This is something you would find in a comic book. This is something you'd find in a Marvel movie. Right? right. And yet it goes on here. But let's look at what happens. If we go back to the beginning of it, where it says, Lobash remind me, the paragraph right before this whole story is, Rabbi Felbo said, a person must always be careful about his wife's honor. Honor your wives. In order that they may come up. So right before this story, it's about marriage. At the very end of the story, what's the paragraph after? Someone who wrongs a convert, or someone who's a Jew by choice, or someone who's an outsider, transgresses three prohibitions. So it's surrounded by conversion on Jew and marriage. The big issue for our sages 2,000 years ago, as it is today, is assimilation under faith and marriage. It's a big concern. Interfaith marriage doesn't lead to the survival of the tribe. So what happens? What if this whole story of that other is about an interfaith marriage? Hmm. Two different substances that are cemented together. Mm -hmm. Eliezer says they love each other, baby. That's whole. Rabbi said, we don't care. It doesn't matter. It's not okay. How many problems would be solved? So you guys were all at the adult B'nai Mitzvah, I think. Exactly. You were at the adult B'nai Mitzvah. We did the adult B'nai Mitzvah. And one of the people went up and she said that her father was Jewish, her mother was not, and so on. She went to go get married. Her husband to be insisted she convert to Judaism because her father was Jewish, her mother was not. But in the reform world, the reform Judaism, they accept a father being Jewish. Okay. In the observant world, a ketubah, they don't. And a ketubah needs to be very specific language. In the reform world, not so much. In the very secular world, could say anything. In the observant world, it must be signed, the ketubah must be signed. Two men, Shomer Shabbat, not related by blood. Formal, they may not care. Well, that's fine. So if this couple gets married, they got a ketubah, they have a daughter. Okay? 
And in their ketubah, it was signed by two women, who were the two friends that introduced them. Okay? These two women are there, are the witnesses. So this nice couple, they have a daughter. She goes to college, she goes to grad school at NYU Film School. And while she's there, she meets a nice boy, a nice Yiddish boy. And he's getting his graduate degree in film. They fall in love, they want to get married. Two Jewish kids, right? This one's from a reform family. He's a more observed family. In fact, his father's an Orthodox rabbi in Crown Heights. Everybody's happy except his parents want to say, Oh, we love our little our little daughter in law to be. We just need to see your parents' ketubah. They show the ketubah to this couple over here. So this, is, this is not a ketubah. It's signed by this woman. It's not, not a ketubah. Your daughter's a mumser. She's a bastard, and I'm not letting her marry my son. Disputes proliferating because there's not a clear definition. So, you know, when I do weddings, not my wedding, it's the couple's wedding. But I recommend very strongly the one thing to do at least, the one thing to do, is to have an ultra-observant The traditional Aramaic, everything traditional. Because 30 years from now, you can't fix it. Okay? Um, and that, by the way, one of the traditions on that as well is there's a word that has a kuf. The letter kuf looks like this. Right? That's what a kuf looks like. Okay? And to in some orthodox circles, okay, to make sure the rabbi really read it, that kuf, the artist leaves it looking like that. Hmm. Now the rabbi has to find the kuf, and he's got to take it, and he's got to put the regal, like the foot on it. Hmm. And so if it's just like that and it doesn't have it, or it doesn't have a hand written on this, they won't accept it as kosher, because they'll say the rabbi never really looked at it. Okay? So, that's not at all observant communities, but it's not. So, I... Oh, okay, so get the regal off the cook. I'll fill it. I'll find out that's always it's typically the same word in back position. But, but the point is that this whole story, if it doesn't make sense, at least to me, excommunicate one of the greatest rabbis of his time. Well, also is your brother-in-law, yeah. right? Invalidate all those decisions over of it. I don't see that anywhere else. Listed. But wait a minute, if it's over defining who can marry whom, how can you say if two people love each other, I don't care if it's Jew, non-Jew, uh, uh, you know, same sex, it's gay, if two people love each other, how can you say God's not there? But if we don't have the definition, then how do you say that you have disputes? Reform says he's, that, that child is Jewish. The Orthodox says that child is not Jewish. Forget about anything else. Think of the pain of that child. You guys were at a dumb name. That's where the person said her whole life she had been told she wasn't Jewish enough. How disgusting. How disgusting. So, or or the, 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 the lines of, you know, someone who converts is not really Jewish. We're taught that the Messiah will be the center for me. Okay. So, Talmud so about disputes. It's, this is so disputes. disputes. And and that's if that's the reason why think about it. If we were very clear, this is a Jew, this is not a Jew. We'd have a lot less dispute within Judaism, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was sent a thing today by Adam Schiff, was forwarded to me. Do you see this? Doing fundraising. I think he sent to everyone, he, it didn't go to me, but everyone he thought that was Jewish in his looking for fundraising based upon my Jewish roots and my Jewish beliefs. And Tikkun Olam, the guy doesn't know what Tikkun Olam is. And I actually wrote a letter, public letter that was in PJ Media calling the task, saying, you know what, we're taught the worst thing you can do is wash and hire other people, gossip, and that's what you do. Um, so, you know, someone wants to say those are Jewish values. And so, so the point is that the, the great thing about Talmud is it, it presents different points of view, but it also creates a pathway of halacha and how we need to live. Why are they so abstruse? Why don't they say, you know, like this, talk about mixed marriage here rather than other I think it's hard. I, I, look, 
I think it's I think it's a hard thing to do um, to talk about certain issues. Why does the Supreme Court make the decisions? They have the job right? with the talk about. Well, but why do they write their issue? Go ahead. They, it deals with analogies all the time. That's what in, in, you're supposed to. I don't want to say this politely. Just say it in the old way. Okay. You're supposed to have the um, foresight. I'll put it that way. To be able to perceive. But it also, you contract. have to study together. Yeah. yeah if you don't discuss it, how do you know? How do you know? Exactly. You don't have. So if you just say, this is the way it is. If you just read it as in literally the way. So if I just read it, okay, and I just say, without having a discussion about it, remember, it's all written in shorthand anyhow. But if I just say point blank, okay, here's the rules, Alan, okay? Let me be clear. Don't engage in too much conversation with women. She's going to hit all of us. <laughs> right? Yeah. On the other hand, if we dialogue about it so we understand why not to, when you're studying. Talmud means you will study, you will teach, go to Alex No way. So, so it, it's meant to explore. It's not meant, see, we are a tradition of the journey, not the destination. Talmud takes you on a journey, as opposed to saying, here. Sometimes it does, but it, it is constantly in a journey for us. We learn how to tap. We learn how to live. We learn what the values are. And we're meant to study as Chavruta, which means holy friends together. If our only Halakha were the Ten Commandments, you know, think of the tip, they'd be very small, but there's all this other stuff in case in the Torah. So people say, Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not kill. Right? Murder. Murder. No, no, they say, they read it, and they read their New James, or King James, or New Standard Version, and it says, Thou shalt not kill. It's a mistranslation. And they say, Who are you to tell me that's a mistranslation? My answer is, Well, studying the Hebrew, so I've got a better idea. But the answer really is, they just say that, and that's the answer. And therefore, you can never, you're never allowed to kill. And when you do kill your sentence, you have to go to the priest and be forgiven. Yeah. Right? As opposed to, thou shalt not murder, and now let's discuss what is murder. Right? So, Talmud explores all of this. And our practices stem from Talmud. There's, I think it's 22 or 26. There's only 20, I think, some 20 some laws we can observe exactly the way they're commanded in Torah, but we can still observe it. One of which, by the way, is one of which is Sukkot. But um, we don't practice biblical Jews, and this tells us how to live. Okay? That's why it's so important. Up until I, I believe you now have to, but I know recently, it's only a few years back, you could graduate, even you're in college, and become a Form rabbi, I never have had to take a class in college. It was elective, it was not a really mandatory class. I know people who told me that. Went there. And, and I don't know how you can learn Judaism or teach Judaism if you're not studying Talmud. No, you can't. I, I don't see how you can. I, 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 I'm not saying you can't, I'm saying I don't see it. And, and, um, and I, you know, I had a rabbi say to me, we stayed open. We've always stayed open. We don't close our doors. And there was a rabbi's wife who posted to her thousands, some whatever, on a Facebook page, Rabbi Barclay and his board should be arrested and die. So I called up this very prominent reform rabbi. I don't really know him. He doesn't really know him. We wouldn't recognize each other in the street. And I said, what are you doing? Well, you're killing people. No. Actually, will not, and it's our decision. And you don't know how we're preparing and keeping things safe, the distance we're having, and that's outside. You're killing people, and you don't have the right to. I said, actually, we have the right to do whatever we want in our, in our community. You get to decide for yours. Our church decides for ours. And moreover, I said, you know, the Talmud says that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed because of baseless hatred, because that's what it says. And his reply to me was, and this is a direct quote: "We're reformed Jews. The Talmud doesn't mean anything." To which I said, well, okay, but the Torah itself says you shall, you shall surely rebuke your neighbor. 
interact like this, and you need to stop this, to which there are a bunch of expletives ending with F U and ending up hanging up on it. So we just swore at everybody else. But the point is, a reform rabbi who's, I'm going to guess he's in his uh, late 60s, he's probably actually, by now, he's probably in his mid 70s, actually, actually said verbatim, we're reformed Jews, the Talmud doesn't mean anything. Well, then, what kind of Jew are you, period? Because how do you, how, all of the last 2,000 years is built on Talmud. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand the foundation of anything you're doing. And when you discuss tikkun olam, reparation of the world, repairing the world, rectification of the world, you're missing the whole point because it's talked about in Talmud. And it's not what Adam Schiff said. It's what's in here. Yes, go ahead. Also, it's interesting that since they, it says that the second temple was destroyed, historically, this is very true, because the worst enemy the Jews had were not the Romans. It was the Jews, the Jews yeah. inside Jerusalem who were fighting each other. But the, but to see, but you have someone who says the Talmud, the word reform just Talmud doesn't mean anything. How can you even say that you are able to teach or expand, learn or explore Judaism? Because that's what it's all based on. That's what all of the later commentaries, everything is based on. It comes from the Torah to not the Talmud. And so it's so much fun to explore. I, I say this all the time. When I was a young man, I thought Talmud was for old men who had too much time on their hands, and it was a waste of time. Now I believe it holds the secrets of the universe. So either it holds the secrets of the universe, or I'm an old man with too much time on my hands. And I realize both are possibilities. <laughs> so the point is that this is really, really important. Pure Kavod is a beautiful thing to begin to study. Ethics of our fathers, this is just one version of it. Um, it is so beautiful to do. It is so much beauty, so much wonder, so much wisdom, so much learning. But it infuses you with a different way of looking at the world. It infuses you with a way of looking at the world to understand. You know, Gamaliel's right. You need to stop having whatever needs to be done to, to kind of stop the proliferation of disputes. But you know, Elias is also right. Two people love each other. Why? He's telling from a spiritual point of view, God himself is saying Elias is right. And from that heavenly point of view, Elias is. From the earthly point of view, Gamaliel is. And both are true. Both are true. So, Talmud is extremely important with all those things. Yes. Sir. What was the book of your uh, This is just one type of edition, but it's called Ethics of Our Fathers, Pirkei Avot, P I R K E I Avot, A V O T. So, it's the teachings or the ethics of our fathers. And there's all sorts of, from small little volumes to lots of big volumes of commentary. Like this particular volume, I don't know how old this one even is. It, it breaks apart different phrases and it'll do commentaries on it and understanding. I, I have one set, I have one copy that's just a huge one like this with lots of commentators. I have another one that's a three volume set because that's how many commentaries there are on it. I, there's lots of commentaries. Pirke Abbas or Pirke Abbas. That's a great way to start and to do you know a little bit each day. It's a great way to, to start learning, but to not just let it go, you know, oh, this is what it says, but to really, that's why it's nice to. To have a commentary like this because it starts to, to guide you through, really explore each sentence and not just blow it off. Because it's easy to blow off these sentences. Yeah. Well, I still find it very difficult to understand the Talmud. Look at a page of Talmud and try to figure it out the way it is. It, it's very, I mean, you to, need to, get, study to get one little Which sentence one? understood. But that's understood. why we study together. We sit there, we don't just study in, 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 in the Hebrew, we study right here. Yes, in English, but even the English. I'm just, Great, so you go through it slowly and you go through it and you learn it together. Yeah. That's the joy of discussing it with a group of people. Because right. you get these variety of insights, and all of this variety of insights, you get to the truth. And, 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 to, and to explore and that truth, playing on that, it says, you know, Thomas says, truth is, the word for truth is M. Aleph, the first letter of the, of the alphabet, Mem, the middle letter of the alphabet. Top the last letter of the alphabet. Truth is the beginning of the end. Moreover, look where the letters come. The a uh comes from deep in scuttle, the ma from our lips, and the ta from the tip of our tongue. Truth is all of it. It's more because if you can point it out to us, what the real discussion was. That's just my opinion of what the real discussion is. 
but it really opens the door and it makes makes it much more clear but that you know that came about because I looked at this and I said this is ludicrous. Doesn't, to me. doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's so I said to Rabbi Shofet, Rabbi, there is something else going on here. Because the way it's described, it's a it's cruel. I said there, there's yeah. no way there there there. This is Gamaliel is going to die, and Elias is getting excommunicated over an oven. <laughs> over an oven. They argue about a lot of things, and that doesn't happen. There's no way because Michael, I think you have a good point there. Like you to please write a paper on it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to be so happy when the key was to look before and after. Because it says in Talmud, one of the ways of do, doing exploration of texts is look before and after. That's why the rabbis in the Middle Ages, when they had to talk, talk against and defend the Torah, the Nachmanides, the disputations, they could not be defeated because of medical logic. And, and, and it's interesting, so that we'll, we'll get to that. We're going to hold on to that because we're, we're going to talk in a few weeks about the disputations and the Ramon and the commodities. Because those disputations the were fantastic. And the judges were all priests, and we still got to yeah. wrong. And, and some of them were converted Jews. The arguing ones who were arguing against not yeah. yeah. So this is in Germany. This is what, what this is. Do you see how important this is? This is like so magnificent and important. Just can't. I don't believe you could possibly. I just realized that this is actually. No, that's such. I didn't realize that these are. This book is commentaries from Schneerson. I don't know. I'm sure it's available. I don't know. I'm um, so just I'm trying to get my bond. Uh, you just you got to explore this stuff to be able to make it make sense and to understand how we're Jewish today. You can't take it ver verbatim. It has to be interpreted. Has to be explored. It has to be, you know, I, I, and and I think this discussion of the oven is such a beautiful example. Another one, the typical one, the, the typical discussion that we start off with when teaching Toma to children is a piece about when an object is when you find an object, is it yours or are you responsible to call it out? And saying whose business? Find the oven. And the wonderful piece of that, I'll give you a very simple one. So. There's this whole discussion of when are you obligated to call it out and when is it yours. And that then moves forward into the rabbi start to discuss, well, it's yours if it has little value and is found in a large area. <laughs> it's not yours if it has great values found in a small area. And they start using purple sheaves of wool and all sorts of apple cakes you know, fig cakes, excuse me, all sorts. And then if it has a simon, a sign on it, so if it says on it, Wagman, it's not mine, even if I find it in a large area. Okay. And uh, if it has a simon, and then it starts getting into these other discussions, and, and it's very long discussions. Because it starts saying, well, if you find this much rice and How much this this distance and this money. What it all comes down to is, does the owner of the item have any hope of recovering it? So my mother, God rest her soul, before I was born, lost her wedding, wedding ring or engagement, engagement. Okay? Somehow she'd taken it off, had gone down a sink, whatever it was. My father more than made up for God. But her whole life, we'd be somewhere, and she'd want to just look into a jewelry store or a pawn shop just in case she could find her ring. She never gave up hope. Right? Yeah. There are things you never give up hope on. So now it starts getting into, well, because the person has hope because it was found in a small area. The person has hope because it has a large value. The person has hope because has a sign on it. So if you found a hundred dollar bill in front of my house, if I found a hundred dollar bill right after teaching a class in my house, having people over, I would have the, the person lost hundred dollars. They may have the hope of finding it. So it's a beautiful teaching because it starts to teach the idea of a child looking at an other. Other than themselves.
other than this, other than look what our town is mine. Don't ask me questions. So let us say that you found this lighter in the Dodger Stadium parking lot. It's 99 cent lighter, no seam on it. Okay, it's yours. Except you don't know what if that was a lighter that was lost by a young man. That it was the last gift that had been given to him by his grandfather before he died, and he considered him his, 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 he was considered his connection to his grandfather. Sure. Now he still is going to have hope. And somebody would get to find it. Right? We taught this to our kids. I think they've forgotten it by now, but we taught it to them for when they were eight to One of them comes home with this little toy that he found in the sand. Oh, but I found I have a little toy here. That's great. Who came from? No, I found it. It's mine now. What if that was a little girl's? Okay. What if that little girl had been given to her by her grandma, who's now dead, and was the last thing that she has with her grandma? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not the next day. It was it was Jewish day school. It goes to the next day. It goes to Jewish and, and Rocky tells him, "We gotta find who owns this." And the teacher's looking at him like it's crazy. But that was a piece of it. So I, this is the, typically the first thing we teach children because it starts to look at yeah. something other than themselves. Oh, it teaches them moral, too. Ethics. 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 So um, again, I looked at Rabbi Shoffin and I said, Rabbi, I'm spending a lot of pages on this. There's something else going on here. Michael, I think that's a very good point. Should write a paper on it. <laughs> uh, and with much meditation, I think there's a whole other dialogue going on as well, which is since every one of us is unique, every one of us has our own Simon, and therefore God never gives up hope on anybody. When we are feeling hopeless, we need to remember God has never given up hope on us. Because we are each unique, and so He has never let go of that hope. I think that's the teaching of it too. And Talmud has all these different levels of teachings. It's meant to be explored, and it's so wonderful. So with that, we'll call it a night. Next week, we're going to move on to more stuff. Um, and, and, you know, does that make Talmud a little exciting? Yeah. Right away, a book. Rabbi, that book you meant, that short man, uh, book you, that you wrote about the Proverbs, Oh, sacred relationships. Right, I recommend it to everybody. Thank you. It's excellent. It is a, it's very profound. Thank it's you. Short, but very profound. Yeah, we don't. I tried to explain to a bar mitzvah boy today that sometimes we use too many words to say too little. We need to use fewer words to say more. Yeah. You know, I think it's important. So, um, wait till you guys experience revelation. Yeah, yeah. When is it again that it's coming? July. No, it's July. July 11th. Right, your balls July 10th. We'll all be here for that. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty. <clears throat> so thank you. We'll take a right. Thank you, Rabbi.